Welcome to Wednesday Yachting Lunch, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Since you can't come down to the grill room, we're bringing the grill room to you. Imagine being a four-year-old and uh, getting into a cardboard box in your backyard and thinking to yourself, man, this is sailing. That's the earliest sailing memory that our guest speaker today had. He remembers also being a 14-year-old 10 years later and watching with incredible excitement as the America's Cup was being challenged for in Perth, Australia. And my service as the general manager of San Francisco's first challenge for the America's Cup, and our friends back in the States were staying out late at night as we chased after the AC down there. Our speaker uh, sailed FJs as, an, uh, as a freshman in Ohio State, from which he graduated to get uh, a BA in history. Uh, he remembers sailing flying scots and thistles in his 20s in Cowan Lake in Ohio. In 1997, after attending his first America's Cup Hall of Fame induction ceremony at the Hairshock Museum in Bristol, Rhode Island, in what would be a fateful sail, he sailed on Shamrock 5 from Bristol, Rhode Island to Newport, Rhode Island. In 2008, he... Um, joined the America's Cup Hall of Fame uh, committee. And then in 2016, one has to count a very big highlight of his sailing life, being elected chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame selection committee, speaking on new perspective of the first defense of the America's Cup. Our speaker today, a chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame selection committee, Steve Tushia. Steve, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks, Ron. I really appreciate your wonderful comments there. Uh, hey, this is my second time again speaking at the St. Francis Yacht Club, and it's always an honor to address such a wonderful group of yachtsmen and yachtswomen in the San Francisco Bay. And so, Ron, appreciate your wonderful introduction, and for the members in attendance, thank you so much for attending this presentation about the America's Cup. Now, the last time I spoke about the America's Cup, I spoke about the origin of the America's Cup in 1851. But today, I want to share the story of the first defense of the America's Cup. That's a Courier and Ives image of the first defense of the America's Cup. Um, so on August 8, 1870, the New York Yacht Club's Yacht Magic, which you see here on the left, defeated 16 of her fellow defenders and the lone challenger from England to complete the first successful defense of the America's Cup for the New York Yacht Club. Now, needless to say, the match, if you can call it that, wasn't quite fair. But in the club's defense, it reasoned that the race mirrored the daunting conditions the Yacht America faced when she took on a comparable sized fleet in 1851. Now, while the fleet race format would not be replicated again, the 1870 race set a precedent for future contests for the cup. And it also fulfilled the vision of the donors of the America's Cup to elevate the trophy from a souvenir to Yachting's first international Perpetual Challenge Prize. On August 22nd, 1851, the Yacht America won the silver trophy that now bears her name in the most celebrated yacht race in history around the Isle of Wight, as we all know. Now, her owners soon sold the yacht, Yacht America, but they kept the trophy. And when they got back to New York, they subsequently donated the trophy on, in October of 1851 to the New York Yacht Club, their home yacht club. Now, what I'm going to do today, just to give you a little agenda, is I want to talk about the challenge that led to the first America's Cup match. I'm going to talk about the, the race itself, the match itself. And then I'm going to wrap it up to talk about the legacy of that match and why it matters. Several years later, in July of 1857, George Lee Schuyler, 
a member of the Yacht America Syndicate presented the trophy's deed of gift to the New York Yacht Club. The deed of gift directed the club to use the trophy as an international perpetual challenge prize for yacht racing. And here it is. This is the 1857 document that's well preserved in the New York Yacht Club's archives. And it was this simple 360 odd word document that launched the Holy Grail of yachting. In July of 1857, the New York Yacht Club sent an invitation to many foreign yacht clubs, inviting them to challenge the America's Cup. But it was over a decade before the first challenge materialized. And the process of setting up that race was far from smooth. That first challenge, many, many years later, in 1869, came from James Ashbury on behalf of the Royal Thames Yacht Club. James Ashbury, in 1866, while he was still in his early 30s, inherited, inherited his father's large, highly profitable railway carriage manufacturing business and a large fortune. But since the age of 16, he had worked long hours in the family trade, especially expanding its international business. Ready for a break, he departed smog-choked Manchester for the seaside resort of Brighton, England, southern England. And there he bought a cruising yacht to improve his uh, health and his lifestyle and, and to also improve his social standing in a culture that valued the, the carefree, carefree lifestyle of the gentry over the hardworking industrialist. A contemporary portrait of Ashbury reflects I think his aspirations quite well. Here he is dressed in a reefer, cradling a spyglass. He relaxes on the stern of his yacht, a strong drink and some grapes by his side. But beckoned by the racing scene on the Solent, he soon got bored of his cruising yacht, dumped it, and he commissioned Michael Ratsey of Cows to build him a fast racing schooner. In 1868, he took delivery of this boat, Cambria, a 227-ton keel schooner, uh, about 108 feet long from stem to stern, draft of about 12, inch, 12 feet, 3 inches. That summer, he soon experienced the rush of winning races and collecting prizes. He won a couple of regattas down in Cherbourg, France, and uh, he even beat a visiting New York Yacht Club yacht, the Sappho, in a race around the Isle of Wight. And many believe it was that race that emboldened him to go after the America's Cup. After a year and a half or so of correspondence with the New York Yacht Club, he submitted a challenge on November 14th, 1869. He was riding from the Suez Canal where his yacht Cambria became the first yacht to transit it. James Ashford in his statement to the New York Yacht Club said, quote, I give you six months notice of my intention to race for the cup. The course to be a triangular course from Staten Island, 40 miles out to sea and back. Now he didn't elaborate on the strange geometry of this course, but hey, that challenge stuck. Ashbury also insisted on the following condition. He said, quote, the cup having been won at Cowes under the rules of the Royal Yacht Squadron, it thereby follows that no center board vessel can compete against the Cambria in this particular race, unquote. Now the New York Yacht Club, they strongly disagreed with Ashbury's condition. See, at the New York Yacht Club, the home waters being New York Harbor, where there are a lot of sandbars and there's some shallow areas, center board schooners are bread and butter to that club at that time. But the New York Yacht Club couldn't walk away from Ashbury's challenge because the trophy's deed of gift granted the challenger 
the inalienable right to contest for the cup, to challenge the cup. Here it is. In fact, to make it easy for us to read, let me uh, focus on the key sections. You see, the first part of the deed of gift is just a preamble. And the part that I'm highlighting here is the operational part that makes the trophy what it is today, a contest for international yacht racing. But let's focus in and let's transliterate it. Here we go. Now it's much easier to read because now it's in uh, typed up font. The key phrase I want to focus on is the very first line. Any organized yacht club of any foreign country shall always be entitled through any one or more of its members to claim the right of a sailing a match for this cup. So you can see the New York Yacht Club just couldn't walk away. But the wisdom of the founders, if you will, and those who authored the Dita gift is evident here. In the second paragraph, there's a clause that says, in case of disagreement as to the terms, the match shall be sailed over the usual course for the annual regatta of the Yacht Club in possession of the cup and subject to its rules and sailing regulations. Now, it helped that George Lee Schuyler was also a member of the committee that addressed Ashbury's challenge. And he invoked this particular clause when he replied to Ashbury. On January 10th, 1870, his committee replied to Ashbury with a solution to break the impasse. That letter said this, Dear Sir, in answer to your communication from the Suez of November 14th, 1869, we beg leave again to call your attention to the conditions upon which the New York Yacht Club holds the Challenge Cup won by America, from some of which there's no power to deviate. Among others, when challenged by the representative of any foreign yacht club, in case of disagreement as to terms, the match is to be sailed according to the rules and sailing regulations of the club in possession. While desirous of meeting your views as far as possible in other matters pertaining to the match, under no circumstance can this committee entertain a proposal which excludes from the race any yacht duly qualified to sail under the rules and sailing regulations of the New York Yacht Club. Respectfully, the committee. Well, they get this. Ashbury accepted the committee's decision and the club was thrilled. Ashbury knew he couldn't argue against this document. Now, given the disagreement as to the terms, the first match for the cup would follow the deed's prescription to hold the race over the usual course of the annual regatta of the yacht club in possession and subject to its rules and sailing regulations. This meant that yachts with center boards could compete and that the America's Cup match would be held over the New York Yacht Club's annual regatta course, which was a 38 statute mile course from New York Harbor to the Sandy Hook light vessel in the Atlantic and return. Now at this club's second general meeting of the year, on March 24th, 1870, its members decided to make only schooners eligible for the cup match. And they also settled to hold the America's Cup race in August or so. And they crucially also voted to, on the question of whether or not to meet the challenger with a single yacht or with the fleet. Commodore Henry Stebbins recommended the former, but his fellow members outvoted him 18 to one in favor of a fleet. Now, to add a sporting element to Cambria's passage to America, Vice Commodore James Gordon Bennett Jr., owner of a 268-ton keel schooner Dauntless, challenged Ashbury for a transatlantic race from Kinsale, Ireland to New York. Ashbury accepted the challenge, and on the 4th of July, 1870, Dauntless and Cambria started their transatlantic race. Here's Cambria at sea. 
during that race. Most Americans expected Dauntless to win. After all, she was skippered by the legendary Captain Samuel Samuels, who had won the Great Ocean Race of 1866 for Gordon Bennett. But on July 27th, Cambria arrived first, beating her rival by only one hour and 17 minutes. You know, so that English yacht's victory truly heightened the anticipation for the uh, inaugural America's Cup match. August 8th, 1870. It dawned dark and gloomy over New York Harbor, but by 9 a.m., the clouds dispersed. Here's the 38.2 statute mile course that they uh, were going to test the merits of Cambria versus the 17 schooners of the New York Yacht Club. I'll let you all study this chart for a moment. Now let's zoom in to the start area between Staten Island and Long Island. Here we go. At 11 a.m. that morning, 17 schooners of the New York Yacht Club and Ashbury's Cambria began anchoring about 50 yards apart, okay, along an east-west line in the Narrows. With the wind from the southwest, Cambria, uh, having been granted the choice of berth, she anchored near the weathermost end of the line. The club schooners included the small centerboard yacht Magic, Bennett's Dauntless, and the venerable America herself, then owned by the U.S. Navy. America took a place near the weather end as well, near Cambria. Magic and Dauntless were on the other side, on the leeward end of the, uh, of the line. Now, anchored in the ebbing tide, get this, the schooners pointed towards the city and their sterns faced the start line, which lay about 500 yards to the south, a parallel line marked by a stake boat on one end and Club Staten Island Clubhouse on the other. Here you can see the start line, again, south of the anchorage. This is the New York Yacht Club's clubhouse on Staten Island, which the club occupied from 1868 to uh, 1871. Now, many spectators lined the banks and hills in great anticipation along the Narrows to watch the start. I don't have any great images of where the spectators stood, but last year I spent some time on Staten Island and I took this series of panorama shots to kind of give you an idea. So here we are atop Fort Wadsworth, and we're looking out onto the Narrows. And you can see the city of New York in the distance. And here we are looking at Long Island and Brooklyn. And below, see, you can see that's Fort Tompkins and Fort Wadsworth. Here's the Narrows Bridge, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And again, to the right is the Lower Bay and Sandy Hook. Now, in addition to spectators that lined the hilltops and the, the banks of the Narrows, there were actually many more on the water, according to a yachting writer named Roland Coffin. So Roland Coffin was a witness of the race and he watched it from a pilot boat. And uh, he said this, he said, the 1870 race was the grandest, quote, the grandest mar marine pageant ever seen in the harbor of New York. Every schooner, yacht, and the club was entered and started. Nearly every steamer in the harbor was brought into requisition for spectators, and all were crowded to their utmost capacity. And besides these, almost everything that could float from a large coasting schooner to the tiny skiff was brought into use. And it seemed as if the whole population of the city was upon the water. Wall and broad streets were deserted for the day and the courts and public offices, offices had but few attendants." Unquote. Just prior to the preparatory signal at 11.21 a.m., the wind shifted though to south by east. Now it placed the boats on the west end of the line, such as Cambria and America at a disadvantage. The guns roared at 11.26, and the schooners raised their sails and weighed anchor as the tide went slack. 
The centerboard is schooner Magic, with sailing master Andrew J. Comstock at the helm, quote, wheeled around as if by machinery, unquote, onto starboard tack, and was the first yacht to cross the start line. The rest of the fleet turned around, and over the next several minutes, Cambria took weight anchor, was able to make it across the line. Two minutes after that, other yachts went into position over the start line. And America, just like back in 1851, she started dead last. The first leg was a uh, 9.5 statute mile run, I mean, sorry, uh, 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 leg to windward to buoy number 10 in the lower bay off Sandy Hook. But here's magic. Let's talk about magic. Uh, she was uh, the second to the smallest boat in the fleet at, at only 89 feet long and 97 tons. However, she took advantage of the uh, handicap system at that time, you know, which was called the waterline area rule, which did, had, which did not tax at all draft or sale area. So she was, she was carrying something like uh, about 6,480 square foot of canvas. And she had a draft of about 17 feet with the centerboard all the way down. Here, let me show you her centerboard. So as you can see, that centerboard makes a big difference and you need it, especially when you're carrying 6,480 square feet of canvas. Now Magic's owner and manager was Franklin Osgood, a mining and zinc manufacturing magnate. Uh, he earned fame first back in the Great Ocean Race as one of the it's, uh, one of the, the organizers, and during an era, you know, when most yacht owners knew very little about sailing, he was a bona fide racing sailor. The New York Herald observed the following: he said, "They said, quote, Mr. Franklin Osgood, owner of the Magic, is a brave and courageous and bold seaman." He goes for every stitch of canvas aloft in a breeze and would himself get in the weather rigging if it would help accelerate the magic speed, unquote. But unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of Franklin Osgood to share with you. I tried my best over the past two years to find a portrait. There's no portrait at the club, at the New York Yacht Club. There isn't one at the Union Club where he was also a member. The only thing I can find that has a good description of him is this passport document I discovered. If you look at the bottom, it says right there, he was uh, about five feet, eight and a quarter inches tall, high forehead, blue eyes, uh, prominent nose, large mouth, and so on and so forth. So there we go. That's Franklin Osgood. Here are his, uh, this is what paid for his yacht magic. That's his uh, Bergen Point Zinc Manufacturing Company. He was the president and owner of the Bartlett White Lead and Zinc Works. Now, this is a, a picture from a Scientific and American Scientific American issue from uh, July of 1870. And what's interesting is in the distance, which is presumably New York Bay, you can see a yacht that looks kind of like Magic. It's pretty cool. Now, Magic sailed toward, towards Fort Lafayette. And after exiting the Narrows, she tacked over to port and was able to lay a course all the way to Dix Island on the West Bank. The rest of the fleet followed and some on port, others on starboard and amid the pack in the Narrows, a large keel schooner, Tara Linta, collided, glanced I should say, with Cambria, causing some damage to both, but Cambria didn't protest. Off Dick's Island, America began to accelerate with astonishing speed, overtaking one boat after another. I mean, she was a crowd favorite and spectators cheered her on. At 12.48, Magic, in the lead, rounded buoy number 10 and followed four minutes later by the Yacht America. At 107, well, I'm sorry, 10, yeah, 107, Camby was a 13th boat around the mark. From this point on, from buoy number 10, which you can see at the bottom there near Sandy Hook, it was a 9.6 mile reach to the Sandy Hook light vessel. But the tide was now flooding and it was a slog to get to the, uh, the light, light ship. On this leg, Dauntless all of a sudden started to accelerate too, like America, and she passed boats while she approached the Sandy Hook light vessel. 
here they are. Here's the scene with magic rounding the light vessel in the lead, clinging to the lead. This Courier Eyes light ship picture is one of my favorites. You can see the private signals. They're fictional though, however, but flying on the Sandy Hook uh, light vessel in the middle, followed by that fleet of schooners. And in the distance to the left, you can see Sandy Hook and the Navisink lights in the distance. Roland Coffin, the same guy who witnessed it, the, the first part of the race, he was at the, at the light ship too. And he said, when the yachts turned, the yacht, um, turned the, uh, around the, uh, the light ship, it was a scene never to be forgotten. Quote, it would be difficult to estimate the number of people who witnessed the turning, but I know I shall be within bounds if I put it at 20,000 people, unquote. At the light ship, magic rounded first at 2.03 p.m. Dauntless was in third. America slipped to fourth. Cambria proved to, improved to eighth position, but she was still about 24 minutes behind magic. On leg three, which is a reach back to the southwest, southwest spit buoy, number, number 10. Again, it was a 9.6 mile return leg, and the wind started to really blow and magic covered the distance in just over 45 minutes. But Dauntless with 11,200 square feet of sail and a 116 foot waterline gained several minutes on this leg on the leader. And she surged into second place when she rounded buoy number 10. But when Cambria just passed Sandy Hook, a strong gust came by and a, uh, the, the four top mast of Cambria toppled down. But despite this, Cambria didn't lose her position in the fleet. On the final run, this is the downwind leg to the finish, it was a 9.5 mile run back to the clubhouse. There was also a three knot flood tide that helped push the schooners along. Gaining, Dauntless competed with magic for line honors. And you can see that here in this beautiful picture that you can find at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can see magic with the white hull and then followed soon be uh, right behind by Dauntless. And on the right, you can see Fort Tompkins and Fort Wadsworth, which I showed you that panorama from at the beginning of the uh, presentation. At 33, at, I'm sorry, at 3.33 p.m., Magic finished first to win the match on both elapsed and corrected times. She completed the 38.2 statute mile course in just four hours, seven minutes, and 54 seconds, breaking the course record. Dauntless crossed the line 90 seconds after Magic, but her high rating dropped her to fifth place on corrected time. America claimed a respectable fourth place, and Cambria, the eighth boat to cross the line, finished 10th on corrected time. Now, while Ashbury didn't win the match, he earned respect and attention from the host club and the public. Ashbury was a guest of honor at a New York Yacht Club dinner in Manhattan, and the club also invited him to compete in Newport uh, later that summer. And Ashbury also brought, on, brought along some trophies uh, to share with the, uh, any of the competitors in the summer long campaign that he had. But a highlight for Ashbury, especially for him, given his quest to climb the social uh, ladder, was uh, hosting President Ulysses S. Grant aboard his yacht Cambria while they were in Newport. Now at the conclusion of this remarkable season, Franklin Osgood sold magic, likely for a nice premium, <clears throat> just as the owners of, Mag of America did back in 1851. And he promptly commissioned a new schooner for the next season. In February of 1871, at a club general meeting, Osgood was elected rear commodore of the club, and he was also awarded a silver trophy commemorating his America's Cup victory. Now this past February, the America's Cup Hall of Fame selected Franklin Osgood as an inductee of the class of 2020. Now Ashbury returned to America in the summer of 1871 for another try at the Cup with the new yacht, Livonia. For this contest, however, the club, on the urging of George Schuyler, changed it from a fleet race to a match race. 
but the club still reserved the right to select from a pool of four designated yachts on the morning of each race. The club also agreed to make the match a best of seven series as well. But Osgood, with his new schooner Columbia, along with his club's, uh, with a fellow club yacht, Sappho, defeated Ashbury again, proving that Osgood's first cup victory was no fluke. Now the legacy. Well, the next five matches used the club course as one of the two courses for the America's Cup match. So what it did was it established the America's Cup as an inshore around the booby contest. I mean, think about this. Had the club accepted uh, Asbury's proposal for an 80 mile race or, or even radically his earlier suggestion for a race around Long Island, who knows? Subsequent America's Cup matches may have been longer distance affairs. But Magic's victory also inaugurated the New York Yacht Club's incredible streak of 24 successful defenses. I want to share with you this chart uh, that I made of the America's Cup matches. You know, this is from 1870. You can see at the top the fleet race, you know, versus the lone yacht Cambria, and all the subsequent races up to 2021, right? You can see that starting 1871, yeah, it became a match race. But again, in 1871, the club could can you choose from a pool of four yachts? As it turned out, they used Columbia and Sappho. So you can see that indicated right on this chart. In 1876, you had a true case where it was a match race, but also where the club committed to only one yacht. Okay, but in 1881, they set up a system of defender selection trials. So that's why I'm showing four boats there, three in light blue and one in dark. Because you see, starting in 1881, the New York Yacht Club formed a committee to evaluate boats to determine who will have the honor of defending the trophy for the club. And it was that advantage, I would say, crucially, that allowed the New York Yacht Club to hold on the cup for so long. Here we are. Look at the streak in the context of the big history of the America's Cup. 1870, 1980, the New York Yacht Club successfully turned away challengers time and time again. But it was with the challenger selection series format that went uh, international in 1970. Okay, prior to that, they had these intranational contests. But in 1970, you had France and an Australian team. And after that, you had more and more contenders from international clubs that allowed the challenger to hone their skills but it also allowed a determined and relentless challenger, Alan Bond of Australia, to return time and time again. And of course, he won the cup in 1983. There's another legacy of this 1870 match, and it was that the first defense, you see, also tested the strength of the deed of gift. Now, while it was revised two more times in the 19th century and amended in the 20th century, its challenger-driven framework and its prescription to overcome disagreements remain core values to this day. Now, since 1870, these values were, spe were specifically invoked two more times in the Cup's history, in 1988 and in 2010. But most importantly, the 1870 race set a precedent for future contests for the Cup. It assured its purpose as a perpetual challenge Cup for friendly competition between foreign, company, foreign countries. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you again for listening to my presentation today. And uh, I look forward to any questions that Ron may have. Great, Steve. Good job. So uh, let's talk a little bit about magic. How much did magic cost? That's a quick, uh, unfortunately, no records exist of how much Osgood paid for the yacht magic, unfortunately. I was trying to find it. Okay. Yeah, that is something I uh, have a fascination with, too, looking at the financial aspects of the company.
And so um, I can tell you this. So he bought the boat secondhand yeah. and had her rebuilt at City Island in New York. He, he improved the boat's performance, added some extra features. Uh, I don't know if he lengthened it, but he did make modifications to the hull, among other things. You know, it's interesting when you compare Magic against, let's say, um, you know, International America's Cup boats, the last monohulls to race for the cup. Mm -hmm. um, an, an IACC boat weighs about 38,000 pounds and had 3,000 working uh, square feet of sail area and 8,000 square foot spinnakers. But Magic had 64, 6,400 square feet. So it had basically had twice as much sail area, being a big schooner, as an IACC boat. It weighed five times as much, so it needed all that canvas, but it was uh, quite a comparably uh, fast ride. And when you look at the lines of it, with a 70-foot uh, draft, a 17-foot draft and an 80-foot hull, um, mm -hmm. you know, she'd be a good ride today. A few other questions. Uh, so, now did George Schuyler write the, the, the gift himself? Did he write the gift or did, and when did he write the gift? Because I thought it was upon the death in 1857 of John Cox Stevens, the founder of the New York Yacht Club. I thought upon his death is when the uh, gift was bequeathed to uh, the New York Yacht Club. So first did George write it himself? Uh, and was he the, wasn't he the youngest at age 40 member of the five member syndicate that John Cox Stevens had? So I've given you a set of questions. First. Yeah, uh, so Schuyler was the youngest, uh, indeed, and, uh, but let's look at the chronology. So when, when the America uh, was sold, you know, the, uh, the members of the America campaign, if you will, like John Cox Stevens and James Alexander Hamilton, uh, uh, Edwin Stevens, when they returned to New York, that was around, it was like uh, late September, or so. But anyway, on October 1st of that year, the New York Yacht Club held a party for Stevens and the America campaigners for winning that wonderful race. Because it, it was a huge deal. It was a huge deal. That evening, they had the trophy. And this was at the Astor House in downtown New York. It was a big hotel. John Cox Stevens got up and he toasted the club. And he presented the trophy to the New York Yacht Club that evening on October 1st, 1851. And he said, oh, by the way, conditions will follow. <laughs> there, there, are some, there are some issues, yeah, you can't just have this. You know? There are conditions attached to this, to this present. Well, over the course of the winter of 1851 and into 1852, John Cox Stevens and several of the other syndicate members met in New York to draft the deed a gift. And Schuyler, we believe, was one of the main authors. They worked out the terms and the conditions, and a draft was completed in May of 1852. And Schuyler submitted this draft to Edwin Stevens and to John Cox Stevens for their final approval and their signature. But the deed a gift was not signed at that time and never made it to the New York Yacht Club. Fast forward to uh, 1857. In June of that year, John Cox Stevens died. And soon after, uh, in the, er the first part of July, George Schuyler showed up to a general meeting at the Hoboken Clubhouse of the New York Yacht Club with a copy, his copy of the deed of gift, the one I showed you earlier today. He made some edits as well, slight edits, but he put, he crossed out the lines. Yeah, I mean, so he crossed out the signatures that he had always on there, because that was just simply his, he just put the names of the, the America's owners there. He said, this is just a copy of the original deed of gift. I don't have the original. It's probably in, Stephen's possession, but I don't know where it is, but I have the copy here of the, the deed of gift. And he said, I hope you can accept this copy. And the club did. And in the minutes of the New York Yacht Club of July 9th, 1857, it said, Schuyler showed up with a copy. I'm just paraphrasing, of course. And they said, we accepted that copy. 
And from that point on, the America's Cup has a perpetual challenge prize was born, if you will, or well, was made. Another question. So in 1851, uh, I remember as a young guy calling it the 100 Guineas Cup when they got one in 1851. What was it called when they won it in 1851? What, what did the cup, what was it called at that point? Yeah, it was known as the Royal Yacht Squadron 100 Sovereigns Cup or 100 pound cup, you can say it either way. And how did, you get, how did we start calling it the 100 guineas cup? Or how did people start mentioning 100 guineas cup? Oh, that was just, well, that so was I just because it sounded kind of cool. It was just uh, one of those cases where, because a guinea and a sovereign are approximately the same value, a guinea is slightly more. I think it just sounded cooler. I don't know, we don't know. But I can tell you that the New Yorkers just started to embrace the name 100 guineas cup guinea cup yeah just and so just, when and so when when do people start calling it america's cup as in the yacht that first won its cup when does that term for the america's cup um come into yeah. popular parlance i in, in terms of popular parlance i would say it really took hold held maybe in the 1880s because in 1870 during the first match it was known as the Queen's Cup, or the hundred, or the one hundred guinea cup, or the International Cup, you know. And it was, I would say, in the eighteen eighties, the word, the phrase, rather, America's Cup, started to become more and more popular. But, but the phrase America's Cup, I saw some documentation. I think even in eighteen seventy, in the minutes where they really referred it to the America's Cup internally within the New York Yacht Club, they've referred it again as the International Cup or again, America's Cup internally, and then later on, the public embraced the America's Cup. When do you see that first usage, calling it America's Cup? Uh, I remember seeing something in the minutes in 1869 or 1870. I have to go through my records. I gotta go through the minutes again. Now, remember John Cox Stevens uh, used to use the press to basically talk about how fast his yachts were in the 1850 and 49 and stuff. when he sailed Laverick and other of his earlier yachts. He used the press. So the question I have is how much press was there in 1870 when America won this first challenge? Yeah, there was tremendous amount of press actually. So the New York Herald, the New York Times, all uh, the New York Sun, all had front page reporting of the 1870 match. Not just on that day, but on the days and weeks leading up to it. And that's why there were so few people working on the stock exchange on Wall Street and others. A lot of people playing hooky. Uh, and overseas too. So British uh, papers and magazines also covered that first defense of the America's Cup as well. One thing that's different though, back then though, they really talked about the races, but strangely, they really didn't cover uh, a, a lot about the personalities the people involved with running magic and running the other uh, boats. So there's very little written about Franklin Osgood, unfortunately. It's only till about, again, the 1880s when papers started to really also have beautiful biographies of the America's Cup competitors. So do we have any numbers on the number of spectators who watched the first match? Yeah, there are. On the water, any words, any words of spectators, period? Yeah, I mean, you know, Roland Coffin mentioned, again, 20,000 just at the Sandy Hook light vessel. And uh, other people put figures like 50,000 or 60,000 on the water, on the whole. You know, those are the numbers we see. On shore, it's very hard to estimate, but, you know, many people say it was certainly, you know, in the 50 to maybe 80,000 people total. We're watching. Total, on land and on, on water. So now you mentioned, you mentioned a Staten Island clubhouse. So I remember that there was a clubhouse in Hoboken. How many clubhouses were there from the founding in 1844 of the New York Club before Morgan gave the current location at 37 West 44th Street? Uh, let's, let's, let's figure this out. Okay, so let me think. So in 1844, the club is founded, right? 1845, they built their first clubhouse and it's in Hoboken, as you said. In 1868, they got rid of, they sold the Hoboken 
clubhouse and moved down to Staten Island, to Clifton, Staten Island. And, that, and they built the one I, I showed you in the presentation. And that clubhouse was in use from 1868 to 1871. But they also had a satellite, sat, satellite clubhouse about the same time, just north of it, on Staten Island as well, like in Stapleton. And that one was in operation for maybe two years, as it was just very brief. The club then decamped their headquarters to Manhattan around 1872, 73. This is just all out of memory. And they had these uh, club rooms in um, near uh, Union Square or Madison Square, I'm sorry, near Madison Square. And then they uh, had a club house on, at 67 Madison Avenue for many, many years. Uh, and when I said many, many years, it's from like the 1870s all the way uh, up to 1901 when they opened the 37 West 44th Street Clubhouse. So, so I got I got to ask you, um, Steve. So how many how many books do you have on the Americas Cup in your own personal life? My personal library, I've got about maybe five hundred over 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 five hundred. Mm -hmm. And which so, is, when you, which is there is something like a thousand books about the cup has been written. So I've got maybe half of it of what's out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not a bad percentage. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about locations of primary research, mm -hmm. um, where do you kids? Tell me about the the places that you find uh, the best sources of primary research information. Yeah, my favorite source for primary research for the America's Cup, especially in the 19th century and the 20th century is 37 West 44th Street. Uh, the archives of the New York Yacht Club is tremendous because they've done a really good job of keeping track of a lot of manuscripts, minutes, among other things related to the America's Cup races. In fact, my presentation that, you, that I presented this, uh, this uh, afternoon is largely based on manuscripts and letters of correspondence between James Ashbery and Schuyler and the committee and all of them is at the, is at 44th Street. So it's fun to look at Ashbery's letter, you know, look at the little uh, logos that he had or the water you know, watermarks, then look at the reply. But sometimes it's a pain in the butt looking at these 19th century documents because they had such bad handwriting, they're, they're hard to decipher. So you really have to spend like 15 minutes trying to figure out like two sentences. But that's one great source. Other great um, sources for primary research is, get this, newspapers.com. That's one of my favorite websites because you can type in a name, type in a city and a, like a year, and it'll go through literally, literally tens of thousands of newspaper pages and help you narrow down something. That's how I found the quote about Franklin Osgood about how he was a great sailor or loved sailing and he could help mm -hmm. make magic spoke go fast. That was from a, uh, um, some June, I think 1870 article, had nothing to do with America's Cup. So that's something that I, I would have easily missed had I not had newspapers.com. And then the, and the final primary source is just interviewing people. So obviously for those who are still alive, I do a lot of interviews. So whenever I travel to America's Cup events and in between, I'm interviewing lots and lots of people. I've, I've talked to you. I spent, remember <laughs> like a couple years ago, I had my tape recorder yeah. talking to you, Ron, right. about USA One. That's what I do. Yeah. That's you are my primary sources. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now the, the author of the Dita Gift, George Schuyler, He's a fascinating character. Yes. Tell us about tell us tell us about George Schuyler, this fascinating youngest member of the syndicate, the five person syndicate that John Cox Stevens has. Uh, how did he get to be such a brainy, thoughtful, uh, important contributor to the legacy of the American Club? Well, I mean, first he had the privilege of birth. He is a Schuyler, right? So he's a member of one of the oldest aristocratic families in America. So his ancestors were the original Dutch founders of, of New York. And his ancestors owned a lot of land north of New York, near Albany. And because of that, it helped him make sure he had a good start. He had a great education. In Where did he go to school? Columbia, Columbia. But it also allowed him to gain access to the highest echelons of society at a very young age, okay? Uh, he, 
had a civil engineering degree, but ended up really managing railroad businesses and other investment firms. His brother, get this, committed, was like, he was like the Bernie Madoff. His brother was the Bernie Madoff the 19th century, he committed one of the biggest frauds in stock market history. His brother was basically selling stock he didn't own, like on railroad companies, and he eventually got caught, and he ran away and disappeared, just vanished, went to Europe and just vanished. Little so brother, big brother? Uh, I don't remember. His name was Robert Skyler, I have to look it up. Uh -huh. But it's, it's just, you know, <laughs> that was not cool. <laughs> but, but luckily, George survived that scandal because they knew that George was a good guy and he was famous for being a man of in high integrity, luckily, you know. But, uh, to, but to further answer your question, he was also one of the founders of the New York Yacht Club with John Cox Stevens in 1844. And so that put him immediately at the forefront of the New York Yacht Club's affairs, right? Then on top of that, he also married into the uh, Alexander Hamilton's family. So he, he married um, uh, one of the daughters of uh, Colonel James Hamilton. And then after she died, he married uh, her sister. So like twice into the family, you know. And so therefore his uh, niece, no, no, I'm sorry, his aunt, what am I saying? His aunt was Elizabeth Schuyler, who was married to Alexander Hamilton, just to give you idea. So it's that kind of pedigree. So now John <clears throat> Cox Stevens uh, commissions the Yacht America to be built. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's at uh, on the east side at 12th Street in the East River. Why does it, he's rich, he's got plenty of money. Why does he pick a syndicate? Why does he have the yacht owned by a syndicate of five guys plus himself? Why that structure? See, that's a question uh, I always wanted too. There's no evidence I can find of why he did that. You're right, he could have easily paid for the whole thing. Uh, unfortunately, the manuscript, yeah, so the, while there's a lot of manuscripts related to the America adventure, that type of literature, that type of evidence does not exist. You know, why it was a syndicate. Um, but if I, but I have my own speculation though. My speculation is they treated the America campaign as uh, as kind of like a fellowship and it's more fun when you're doing it with other people. You now these are amateurs who enjoyed yacht racing and enjoyed the company of their friends and and Stevens and his brother and uh, Skyler. You know, they were, you know, these are people who wanted to and, uh, you know, dine together and race together. It's more fun. I think that's, that's my speculation. That's why they did it with syndicate. How big was the crew on Magic in 1870? Hmm. I really don't know, actually, because I can't find any numbers on that. There, again, there's very little written on the personalities. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for me to even find out who the sailing master was, let alone how many members there were on the boat. Mm -hmm. But if and, I had to speculate and guess, I mean, you, I would imagine 30 people, probably. And what about, what about Skipper? And were these paid Skippers on both boats, on Cambria and Magic? Yes, yes. So, uh, like on Cambria, uh, James Asprey hired a guy named Dixon Kemp, which you may know, right? So he was a, a writer, British author of yachting books. And he was also a uh, kind of like a designer as well, an engineer. Uh, but on the, yeah, and on the magic side, he had, in addition to uh, Comstock, he had a afterguard that was professional. I mean, everybody was professional practically, except for Osgood and maybe one or two of his friends. Now, when, when uh, Cambria came over, how long did she stay in America before she went back over? Oh, she was there till at least till the fall. So she was there from, so she arrived in like late July. And I don't think she left until, you know, a October, I think, September, October. So tell me what other, what is your favorite America's Cup book? Book on the uh, America's Cup. Well, uh, it's, there's so many, but I want to say there are two. I like to say it this way. Number one, anything written by John Ruminier. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So like his book, The Golden Pastime is excellent. His book on the New York Yacht Club is excellent. 
and they both contain wonderful histories of the America's Cup in those books. I like the New his New York Yacht Club book because it puts the America's Cup in the context of the New York Yacht Club's history as well, which is a great way of telling the story. My other favorite one that I always bring up is Roger Vaughn's book, The Grand Gesture, uh, that was published in the early 70s. It's about the Mariner campaign in 1974. You know, that, that book is so well written. And it also, if you read that book, the Mariner book, you know, The Grand Gesture by Roger Vaughn, you're gonna get a pretty good understanding of how America's Cup campaigns work and the essence of what the America's Cup is. It's very poetic that you could talk about um, Ra uh, Vaughn and <clears throat> the Mariner. We can't, this is a family show, so we can't at all quote Ted Turner on the yeah. uh, Mariner. Those yeah. who were good at research can look up his phrase for the uh, Mariner and why yeah. its shape was we can't yeah. say it. I we can't, can't say, say it here. No, no, it's, it's a family show. We can't talk about Ted Turner's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. quote about the uh, Mariner. Right. Um, mm -hmm. What researchers, what America's Cup researchers do you, as a researcher yourself, an esteemed researcher, uh, who do you who do you like and who do you respect, and whose work are you uh, uh, you know do you like uh, in terms of America's Cup researchers? Yeah, my 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 closest. Uh, researcher slash friend would, for America's Cup activities is without a doubt Robert Caymans of Chicago. Uh, he, he and I co-authored with Diane Swintle the book Winging It, which is about the 2013 America's Cup. But Robert Caymans and I, I mean, he's kind of like my sounding board. He's like my go-to guy, you know, uh, because he's somebody like me. We're both passionate with look with looking at primary sources to piece together the history of anything, America's Cup or otherwise. John Ruminier is always going to be there. I mean, he's always a phone call away and he's always been my longest term mentor. You know, I mean, so, so when Cambria comes out here to race, um, does she practice with other boats in the race location beforehand? And did she have aboard any local knowledge? Any local sailors get on Cambria? To provide local knowledge. Yeah, there's no evidence of any local sailors joining the boat or the team. And to answer your question, did she have much time to familiarize herself with New York Harbor and the Lower Bay? The answer is no, because as soon as pretty much when she arrived uh, in late July, I think it was like the July 27th or something or something, I have to look at it, think about it, the match started on August 8th. So you, they only had a very little time just to get the boat re-rigged for round the buoy racing. So that's what the things they had to work on primarily, getting the boat ready for round the buoy racing. So now, now, and the start, the start was a, what we call modern terms a bang and go race, where you start at anchor and then you weigh anchor mm -hmm. and, um, and start out. Um, Yep. What, was it, what was that kind of a race called back in those days? Was it called the bang and go race or was it just the way races were started? Yeah, they, they just call it an anchor start is the word I see a lot or the phrase I see a lot mm -hmm. versus a flying start. That mm -hmm. was the term they used for, you know, when you just, uh, you have a countdown and... When do flying starts start in the history of yacht racing? For the America's Cup, the flying start was implemented as soon as 1871. So in 1871, they had some races that were started at anchor and others uh, flying start. And then starting, then for the America's Cup match after that, they were all flying starts from, from that, that point on. But now, right after, the other right. way I'm gonna say, New York Yacht Club races, like during the 1840s, 50s and 60s, a lot of them started at anchor. Uh, but it's hard to discern, again, how many or when the flying start began with the New York Yacht Club. But I can tell you the, do the dominant format of starting races from the 1840s to the, you know, I'll say the early 1870s with the New York Yacht Club was anchor starts. And the way they would do it is they would put like the slow boats on the start line, like the second class sloops. Then they'll put the first class sloops a couple hundred yards after behind, you know, the second class loops, and then the schooners would be a couple hundred yards behind the first class loops. See, that's why the schooners started about 500 yards north of the start line for the 1870 match. They're just following their internal regulations. Schooners start 
above the start line or well behind the start line, depending on how you want to say it. Now, the wind shift right after the start, can you talk a little bit about this wind shift? How far into the after the start does it happen? And was there any awareness, was there any criticism of local knowledge that the shift was coming? Yeah. Well, yeah, so let's just review it. You know, it was, the wind was from the southwest at, at, as the boats were getting ready to, to put themselves in position for anchor. The club gave Ashbury the right to pick their berth. Apparently, the afterguard felt, hey, let's take the weather end of the line. Okay. But interestingly enough, uh, Franklin Osgood and James Gordon Bennett elected to anchor on the uh, leeward side. Okay. Perhaps they knew that in those conditions, maybe the wind will clock more towards the south and south by east. Perhaps they knew that. Unfortunately, frustratingly, there's no evidence that I can find that shows why they positioned themselves where they did the, Amer the magic and Dauntless. But interestingly enough, Yacht America, though, was they opted to anchor next to Cambria on the weather end. And the smallest boat, Alice, she was on the far, far west end, on the far, far weather end. So there were clearly some New York Yacht Club members who felt that was okay to, to go there. Now, when you look at the history of the America's Cup, I mean, other races, predominantly the wind just comes from the south. And, and, but there are many other races that come from the southwest. So it, I have to go through the, here, I, I can show you something, just a second. <clears throat> This is great. Having a conversation with America's Cup historian, of course he'd have a chart handy. See, I made this chart last year. Yeah. I'm sending this one to you. That's what I sent you. I sent you. You should get it in a couple of days, by the way. Uh, according to, so when I did research here, I found out this. Here's, here's the deal. 56% um, of the time, the wind uh, came from the south at the start of the New York Yacht Club course. 33% of the time, the wind came from the Southwest and 11% of the time it came from the West. Now it's still, that's a small sample because it's only yeah. covered seven matches, you know, but you know. Okay, so uh, uh, one last question. In uh, 1851, you'll recall that when the Yacht America got to um, England and was sailing around in the Solent, uh, and they couldn't get a race going. Mm -hmm. They had the time during which a local British craftsman, shipwright, suggests and proposes a boom for the jib, a big, very long boom for the jib, mm -hmm. which uh, enabled the downwind performance of the Yacht America. Um, it was an incredible enhancement to the downwind performance. Were there any enhancements made in the few days at Cambria? had after she got to America by an American shipwright of any sort. Yeah, but before I address that Camry uh, issue, however, the jib boom that you speak yeah. of it did yeah. break off on the uh, southeastern part of the course. Yes. They had lost that, actually, you know. Right. Um, but, 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 but the idea was it was given to them by a Brit in the head of the rope, and it did help when it was up. Yeah. And had it stayed up, it would have helped even more. Uh, but was there any idea like that that was adopted by Cambria once she got states? Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no evidence of them. I, all I can say, there's no evidence of Cambria using American resources to enhance their boat. But that doesn't mean it happened, of course. It just simply, I guess, there's no, there's very little about what specifically Cambria did to prepare for the match. Let's put it that way. They might have used American. So, um, so Steve, it's been so fun speaking with you, and uh, it's it's terrific having you as a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And uh, when you're next out on the West Coast, let's hope that the club is open and we can have you come back again and uh, speak. Your original talk was uh, a great favorite uh, at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon when we were meeting in person. And so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Um, our guest today, um, America's Cup historian and chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee, Steve Tashia. Thank you very much, Stephen.
uh, I've enjoyed your uh, time uh, greatly. Thanks so much. Okay. With that, the, You're very the welcome. luncheon is adjourned. You're very welcome.